Um, um, I'm very happy to welcome today our speaker, Declan Madonna. Um, he is uh, formerly with the IPA, which is the In Institute of Public Administration. Institute of Public Administration. Um, so he comes from the public policy area, but he's sort of been right smack dab in the middle of all the Irish banking crisis, which by definition is kind of the Euro banking crisis too. And um, when uh, the uh, memo came across my desk that he was going to be here in town and uh, was willing to do a guest speaker uh, slot, I grabbed it as soon as I could because it kind of fits right in with this. And I think I've got, don't I have some people in here that are going to be in my risk management class in the next seven weeks? Okay, those of you that are, this is really contingent, uh, I mean, really goes right to what we're talking about, because we'll spend some time in that class on bank risk and Basel II and Basel III and some of the other stuff that's come up with respect to bank risks and uh, dealing with this whole instability in the system and bank reactions to uh, the financial crisis. And uh, with that, um, now, is, is it okay if they ask questions as we go? Or would you rather them wait, save the questions till the end? Because of the length of the paper, I think it's probably best that we leave the questions to the end. Okay. If you would just wait, um, you know, jot down your questions, uh, save them till the end. And uh, Jimmy's phone just went off. I need to remember to turn mine off too. So if everyone would make sure your, your, your phones are on vibrate, that would be great. Um, and uh, we'll save the questions to the end. Uh, it should be about maybe uh, about 55 minutes to an hour on the talk, so we'll have time for questions afterwards. All right? All right, with that, uh, Declan, I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Masson, and good morning to you all. You're gluttons for punishment if you want to listen to the Irish banking crisis at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, thank you, indeed, for the invitation to speak. Um, as some of you know, it is my first ever visit to Bloomington, and I'm happy to share with you what I hope will be an informed background to the Irish banking crisis. I'll be primarily, as DJ has said, from the perspective of a public policy or a public administration analyst. I do have some background dealing with the private sector in Ireland and indeed with the uh, American FDI companies uh, in the Republic, and there are many of those. My overall contention is that in the last three years, and in the last six months in particular, we in Ireland are certainly in a difficult space, in uncharted waters, but that ultimately we can and we will rise above our current challenges. To the extent that we do will depend on our ability to learn the real and important lessons from what has happened in the last decade or so. And it is a decade or so. And that's why in my address to you today, I shall attempt to provide somewhat more detail as to the hows and the whys of how we got into this mess, as opposed to the sometimes superficial soundbite assessments upon which some media and market commentators rely. Over the next hour, or 55 minutes to an hour or so, I will say something of the following. First, a general background of the fiscal and banking crisis in Ireland. Secondly, touch briefly on the scope and structure of the institutional banking system. Thirdly, to seek to isolate the pertinent factors that, so to speak, we sleepwalked into banking troubles. Fourthly, examine the government's responses and the uh, austerity measures introduced, and finally, proffer some personal comments on the likelihood of us getting out of the crisis going forward. At the outset, in the next few overheads, I produced a few contextual slides. <coughs> There's a map of Europe, I hope. Uh, we're that little spot there up in the northwest, outside of Britain. We keep well away from Britain, as you know, as Irishmen. Uh, closer picture, you will notice we are there with what I now call the United Kingdom. As you see, <coughs> the Brits haven't left Ireland entirely. Uh, we are that little yellow space between 51 and 55 latitude, 
I believe that we are about the size of, in UK terms, in terms of population, uh, we're about the size of Birmingham City Council in the UK, or um, uh, trying to remember the American state, but we're smaller than most American states. Um, there's a few stats. Area, 70,000 square kilograms. Population, about 4.5 million at the moment. Employment, about uh, 2 million. Unemployment has risen at the end of 2010, although I, I believe in yesterday's uh, <coughs> figures that came out, it's about 13.3%. Again, for students of, uh, here's our, the total um, EU GDP, EU being the European Union, and our share, or the share of different countries uh, in the European Union, and you will see that we're not entirely the biggest or the best in that respect. We're stuck there about a third from the top. Here are some figures on the uh, per capita GDP uh, and, um, uh, and GNP per capita. Now, firstly, I'd like to give an overview of the performance of the Irish economy. Ireland is a small and open economy. When we joined the EU in 1973, the country was the least economically developed member with a purchasing power equivalent to 64% of the European Union average. <coughs> 35 years later, in 2008, we had the second highest purchasing power in the EU, 40% above the other member states, the average of the other member states. So clearly, our membership of the European Union was undoubtedly the single biggest factor in creating that development. It started with us getting to, to a market, given that we have only a population of about four, but it started with getting to a market of over 250 million people in 1973 and almost 500 million people as of 2009. That, of course, made us very attractive as an investment location for companies who want to do business, not just in Ireland, but throughout Europe. An upward curve, of course, was not always sustained during the last three decades or so. The early part of this period was difficult. However, economic and public sector reforms set in train in the late 1980s, when we had our last crisis, assisted by European Union structural funds, provided the basis for the turnaround that made the country the fastest growing economy in the EU during the 1990s. Ireland exhibited a number of classic ingredients for, ingredients for success, including an outward orientation and well-functioning markets. There was a sharp increase in investment, especially foreign direct investment. Companies were attracted by Ireland's proximity to a large European home market. We had a young, well-educated population. 70% of our college graduates, our school graduates, uh, enter third level. We were English speaking, and we had a low, and some people would say our most important asset was a low corporate tax rating, which as you know is 12.5% currently. The huge foreign direct investment by the US multinationals in Ireland in particular is in the areas, primarily in the areas of technology, pharmaceutical and medical devices. I think nine of the top ten world's largest IT companies are in the Republic of Ireland, many of whom have their uh, European headquarters in Ireland. Google last week, Google has about, uh, Intel has about 4,000 members. Uh, about 20 miles from my house, Google last week has uh, doubled their numbers for going forward. A government agency, the IDA, the Industrial Development Authority, has been highly successful 
in attracting this foreign direct investment, not just from the U UK but elsewhere, which has benefited both the country and foreign companies and the foreign companies themselves. Thus, a rapid growth in employment was fed by large labour inflows and higher participation rates. A period of sustained productivity growth reflected greater investment in education and major structural changes within the economy. From 1986 to 96, 10 year period, these factors helped boost Ireland's real GDP to an average growth rate of 5.1% a year, compared to OECD average of 2.4%. Ireland experienced a period of high growth in the 1990s, when real GDP growth reached 11.3% in 1997 and 9.4% in the year 2000. While not sustaining that level of growth subsequently, Ireland's annual GDP growth averaged 6.5% in the period 1990 to 2007, basically the last decade. Total employment, which fell by an average of 0.8% per year between 1980 and 1986, rebounded over the next decade by growing at 2.1% per year compared to an OECD average of 1% and the EU average of 0.3%. The growth in employment practically wiped out unemployment. <clears throat> unemployment, as you know, has always been a problem for Ireland. We have been an island nation and we have benefited by sending our people to the United States, to Australia, to New Zealand, to the UK. But in the period in question, we had wiped out unemployment while at the same time absorbing an increase in the labour supply through the influx of uh, immigrants attracted by the Irish economic boom. At one point, we had over 400,000 uh, Polish people working in Ireland. To give you an idea, in terms of the scale of the economy, that was a massive in, uh, influx from, uh, from parts of the European Union. This period of high economic growth between 1995 and the year 2000 led uh, to many to call the country the Celtic Tiger. But the nature of the Celtic Tiger changed somewhat in the new millennium, as the main engine of economic growth switched to the domestic construction sector and consumer spending. Demand for housing ro rose along with income levels. However, by the year 2006, the construction market began to fall back from its previously unsustainable high levels and a significant uh, rebalancing of the economy began and is now significantly underway. Sorry, I should have, I, I should have uh, sorry, back we go. Yes, banking in Ireland. I want to say something about the structure of banking in Ireland. The beginning of Irish banking can be traced back to, wait for it, the 1600s, although branch banking did not appear until the 1820s. The basic structure of Irish banks remained largely unchanged from the latter part of the 19th century until the 1960s. The decade saw a wave of mergers and acquisitions which represented part of a process where Irish banking sought economies of scale and strengthened itself to cope with the threat of external takeovers and increased competition from abroad. The period of consolidation reduced the numbers of clearing banks, mainly high street banks, from eight to four. The 1960s and the 1970s saw the entry of a number of North American and European banks into the Irish market, increasing competition primarily for non-retail business. In the 1970s, four clearing banks dominated retail banking in Ireland. Competition was limited and interest rates were set by arrangement. Competition amongst these banks was increased in the 1980s by the ending of the interest rate arrangement and subsequently by increased competition from other institutions. A large number of credit institutions offer banking services in Ireland. A majority of these are incorporated in Ireland while the remainder are authorised in another EU member state and operate in Ireland on a branch basis. 
the building societies, for example, where specialised mortgage lending institutions traditionally, although the Building Societies Act 1989 allow them to diversify into other act banking activities. One building society, the Irish Nationwide, has an important role as a result of speculative property-based lending in the country's uh, later financial crisis. And I'll revert later on to that. I might also mention here the International Financial Services Centre, or known locally as the IFSC. The Irish government established the IFSC in 1987, and it has since developed into a significant centre for a wide range of internationally traded financial services. The majority of the licensed banks in the IFSC concentrate on granting relatively low-risk, low-margin credit facilities to high-quality international corporate consumers, central and regional governments and banks, and indeed some of the electronics industries would be in that, uh, that we have had dealings with. For the most part, funding is obtained from wholesale sources and from parent banks. Internationally, barriers in the provision of different financial services have been greatly reduced and the various financial institutions can now provide a broad range of financial products. This has led to a growth of financial conglomerates worldwide. Moreover, the single European market operates for financial products and importantly so for banking so that there are no regulatory barriers to banks from other EU countries competing in Ireland or to Irish banks, in turn, competing in any other EU country. And of course, as part of that process, some banks have come and gone, in addition to mergers and so forth. But suffice to say it at this stage, we have what I think can be reasonably described as a fairly sophisticated financial services industry, a critical part of which, as we shall see shortly, let the country and its taxpayers down very badly. Currency matters. Before the introduction of the euro notes and coins in January 2002, Ireland used the Irish pound, or as it was known, the punt. Nothing to do with American football or whatever. In January two, 1999, Ireland was one of 11 <coughs> European Union member states which launched the European single currency, the euro. As I've said, there are a large number of credit institutions incorporated in Ireland, but the, re the retail banking system is dominated by the big four. Allied Irish Banks, Bank of Ireland, Ulster Bank and National Irish Bank. And in dealing with the crisis, the, the banking crisis, these are the banks most relevant with their high street branch networks, which are systemic to the operation of any modern economy. One other bank, Anglo-Irish Bank, a relative latecomer on the scene, and which concentrated on property lending, much of it speculative as it grew, has been a huge or major negative contributor to our financial woes or crisis. Allied Irish Banks, publicly quoted and one of the best known companies on the stock exchange until recently. Bank of Ireland, publicly quoted on the stock exchange. And these two, Allied Irish Banks and uh, Bank of Ireland, are uh, by far the banks with the biggest branch networks. They basically have branches in nearly every village and town in Ireland. And so they're the most important players in the economic life of the country. Ulster Bank and, Anglo -Irish, uh, and National Irish Bank are subsidiaries of uh, major foreign banks. Anglo-Irish Bank was publicly quoted on the stock exchange but is now nationalised, but there's more on this story tomorrow, the horror story tomorrow, uh, <coughs> later. Uh, financial services regulation, who regulates? Your equivalent of the Federal Reserve uh, is the central bank. Uh, and it has been the financial services regulator of, of Ireland. The bank was the issuer of Irish pound banknotes and coinage until the introduction of the euro currency and now provides that service to the European Central Bank, the ECB, 
The bank was founded, this, the central bank, was founded in 1943. Since January 2000, uh, 1972 has been the banker of the Irish government in accordance with the Central Bank Act. However, the, after the enactment of the Central Bank and Financial Services Authority Act of 2003, the previously unitary uh, organisational structure was split with a semi-autonomous entity established for financial regulation, then embracing all financial services and not just banking, with an emphasis on consumer protection. This was the position as of the year 2007. Uh, I want to talk a little bit now post-2008. It brings me to 2008 uh, and beyond and to the development of the crises, I use the word, which gathered increasing pace over the course of the past three years as the Irish government uh, sought to stabilise a rapidly deteriorating fiscal and financial position. As I've noted previously, Ireland's annual GDP growth averaged 6.5% in 1990 through 2007. In the first 12 years of that period, growth was largely attributable to the US multinationals establishing manufacturing and service bases in the country. That period saw rising employment associated with increased competitiveness and a quadrupling of real exports. However, following the country's adoption of the euro in 2002, its growth was primarily fueled by a property boom that the government, in part, could be said to have promoted through the subsidies to the sector. Per capita GDP surged, surpassing, would you believe, the United States by 2007, which, of course, resulted in undermining the country's competitiveness. For a long time, however, Ireland's overall fiscal policy was considered to be exemplary because the country achieved fiscal surpluses, surpluses every year from the mid-1990s to 2006, including uh, the creation of the Pension Reserve Fund. This was to hedge against future pension costs and, I suppose, to make the budget surpluses politically more acceptable. I need to digress for a moment to refer to the, established of, uh, the establishment of a very important government agency. At the end of 1990, just 20 years ago, the government established uh, what was a very successful National Treasury Management Agency, the NTMA. This agency managed the assets uh, and liabilities of the government of Ireland. Since 1990, it has expanded greatly for example, it now manages the National Pensions Reserve Fund, which I've uh, referred to just a moment ago. In April 2009, the government announced the establishment of a National Asset Management Agency, or NAMA, under the aegis of the NTMA. I'll say more about NAMA later, but suffice it to note at this juncture that this was the agency which was mandated to take over bank assets in the recapitalization of banking institutions. However, property prices began to fall in 2007. On the supply side, the numbers of homes being built reached multiples of the long run, run, the long run average and the building industry had swollen to a size relative to the rest of the economy that was way out of line with history or comparable countries. Despite this, prices rose rapidly and at the sort of rates that usually signal something is decidedly awry. Rates of credit growth were in the stratosphere. Ireland went from getting about 5% of its national income from house building in the 1990s, the usual level for a developed country, to 15% at the peak of the boom in 2006-2007, with another 6% uh, arising from other construction. At the peak of the property boom in 2006, close to, wait for it, 90,000 houses uh, or new homes, well in excess what, of what was needed, were built in the Republic. I can't give you the parallel, for, for, but bear in mind we have a population of 
you know, and a half million, but it, that's a huge amount of building. Take the bottle on steroids. <laughs> uh, they were built in the Republic last year, 2010. Its total could be as low as 7,500 housing units. And uh, 2011 could struggle to match even that. The outcome over the past three years was that employment in the industry had fallen by two-thirds to under 100,000 construction workers, while the industry's value to the economy had slumped from 40 billion to 17 billion, well over half. Irish property developers, these were the Donald Trumps of the Irish economy, speculated billions of euros in overvalued land parcels such as urban brownfield and greenfield sites. They also speculated in agricultural land, which in 2007 had an average value of 23,600 euro per acre. That's about $32,000 per acre, uh, which is several multiples of the value of equivalent land in other European countries. Cause of the problem? It's classic. Too much mortgage lending, financed by heavy borrowing by the banks, into an unsustainable house price and construction boom. For a long time, the boom seemed credible enough to borrowers given the sharply lower interest rates with the adoption of the euro in 1992. On top of the protracted expansion in output, employment and population, especially in the mid-90s. By mid-2008, uh, mid it was clear that the crisis in the subprime market in the United States and its associated liquidity squeeze was having a major impact on financial institutions and banks in many countries. Bear Stearns had been taken over by J.P. Morgan with the support of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and financial institutions in both the United States, for example, Citibank, Merrill Lynch, and in Europe, UBS, Credit Suisse, RBS, HBOS, Barclays, Fortis, Society Generale, were continuing uh, to raise a significant volume of additional capital to finance inter alia major realised losses on assets, diluting, in a number of cases, existing shareholders. As you well know, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae had to be taken into US government conservatorship when it appeared that their capital position was weaker than expected. We can, say, we can certainly say that the global financial market turmoil, which began in 2007 and intensified in the autumn of the past year, has had adverse implications for the world financial system. This global background, compounded by domestic factors, has had serious consequences for the Irish banking system. This has necess necessitated various public supports for our banking system, including the introduction of a government bank guarantee, recapitalization of some of the banks, and in a couple of instances, nationalization. The purpose of these intervention measures was to facilitate the security of savings and the efficient flow of credit to the wider economy in order to support activity and underpin employment. Economic recovery, as you know, is not possible without a, a properly functioning banking system. I'll return to that later. Two years ago, our banks were in crisis. The money that they had lent was secured against properties whose values had collapsed. This damaged their balance sheets, threatening their solvency. Nervous investors sold their shares, further hitting their ability to raise capital. At the same time, big commercial depositors began to move funds out of Irish banks. On the 30th of September 2008, the Irish government declared a guarantee that was intended to safeguard the Irish banking system. The Irish state guarantee, backed by taxpayer uh, funds, covered, and I quote, all deposits, retail, commercial, institutional, interbank, covered bonds, senior debt, and dated subordinate debt. The government's intervention came during the most stressful of weeks during the global financial crisis, when one of the banks apparently proved unable to roll over its foreign borrowings 
and had effectively run out of collateral to refinance at the ECB, the European Central Bank. It should be noted that after the collapse of the US investment bank Lehman Brothers, funding markets effectively closed, which led the government to guarantee 400 billion pounds, uh, 400 billion euro uh, of deposits and debts at the six Irish-owned lenders, including Anglo-Irish Bank. Contagion, a run in the banks, was a real threat at that stage. The following April, that's uh, April 2009, it announced the uh, establishment of NAMA, the state agency that would buy back bank property-related loans at a discount, allowing them to clear up their balance sheets. Against the background of this impending crisis, NAMA, in March 2007, finally began the job of taking over some 80 billion, pound, 80 billion euros or so of commercial property loans from the five Irish banks guaranteed by the state. That's AIB, Anglo-Irish, Bank of Ireland, the Educational Building Society and Irish Nationwide. The agency, by the way, did acquire further loans later, as we'll see. The government originally predicted that the discount would be about 30% and said that it would provide funds directly to the banks to allow them to repair their balance sheets, raise money and begin lending again. However, once NAMA began taking over the loans in March 2010, it emerged that the banks had misled the state about the full extent of the problems and the discounts were in fact closer to 50%. Of all the banks, the recipient of the largest tranche of government recapitalization aid was Anglo-Irish Bank. As a consequence, and to understand clearly one of the key triggers of the Irish financial crisis, it may be useful to look briefly at the development of this bank, which has been a major player or alleged villain in the crisis overall. Anglo-Irish Bank was founded in 1963, uh, in 1971 uh, it listed on the stock exchange, 77 uh, it had deposits of about two, uh, two million sterling, uh, but 2.5 million euro, billion euros. In 1978 the bank was acquired by Citibank and in 1986 it enlarged to, the, to be the Anglo-Irish Banking Corporation. Importantly, it ushered in a culture previously unseen in Irish banking. Entrepreneurship was key, with the ability to get big deals done in a day that would have taken other banks a period of weeks. Paying its staff and executives uh, well became another feature of the bank. And unlike established banks, where employees had to serve their time before landing senior positions, Anglo promoted a culture a youthful culture. By the mid-1990s, Anglo was emerging as a property specialist. It set up uh, an Isle of Man operation to support its growing sterling loan book and went on an acquisition spree to boost its international reach. By 2004, Anglo had become the 10th fastest growing bank in Western Europe having established a reputation as a niche lender with huge exposure to property developers, commercial property portfolios and construction projects. It wasn't just in Ireland that the bank lent aggressively. Through its U US private client division, it bankrolled the construction of Chicago skyscrapers and Boston shopping centres. The big banks uh, let Anglo plough its own property furrow at that point. The lack of competition, of course, meant that from a profit of 100,000 punts, in other words, approximately 130,000 euros in 1980, Anglo-Irish Bank recorded a stellar annual profit of 1 billion by the year 2007, despite the fact that at that stage, other banks uh, were emulating Anglo's grip on the property market by wading in recklessly. By 2008, the Irish economy had started to slow down with the property bubble about to burst. Doubts were being expressed by, uh, about Anglo. Hedge funds were the first to attack, short-selling Anglo stock uh, 
which led to 15% uh, or almost 1 billion uh, of the bank's market value being wiped out on, wait for it, St. Patrick's Day 2008. As rumours circulated about the exposure to bad debts, it was the beginning of the end for the bank, but in typical bullish fashion, it blamed short sellers uh, for the massacre. It emerged later, of course, that there had been large loans given to directors of the bank and some irregular balance sheet adjustments. Over the summer of 2008, things continued to get worse for Anglo. Uh, the family of an Irish business tycoon, Sean Quinn, taking a 15% share in the bank, it later increased this to 28% before reducing it in a careful placement of stock amongst 10 secret investors. On January the 15, 2009, the government moved for uh, f foregoing recapitalization of Anglo, uh, of Anglo for outright nationalization. The lender's debts were now the country's debts. Quinn was estimated to have lost about 2.5 million euro in the nationalization. Runaway profits turned to record losses. In 2009, the Banker magazine ranked Anglo as suffering the worst losses of the world's banks. As the bank has just now recently set a new record for uh, half-year losses at 8.3 billion, you can expect it to top the league table again in 2011, if it is still around. By 2010, the niche property lender had turned into a black hole. It was originally hoped that 4 billion would solve Anglo's mess. But this has soared to 22 million, billion with nationalisation. And since then, the amount has jumped to 25 billion, with Standards & Poor estimating that the total cost of bailing out the banks will uh, rise to 35 billion. In or about the same time, new rules uh, increased the amount of capital banks were required to hold. This meant, of course, that the state had to provide them with more direct aid. As the state had effectively taken over the bank's liabilities, the uncertainty about the final cost meant that foreign investors who lent money to the government began to question its ability to repay those debts. These same investors began to, to, began to increase the interest that they charged on Irish government bonds. The yield on those bonds rose past 6% last September, a record level. The situation on the bond market has further deteriorated and the yield has topped 9% earlier in 2011. As a result, the National Treasury Management Agency, the NTMA, has been forced to withdraw from the bond market and the government is now going to return uh, and, and is not going to return to the bond market until some time later this year. You will be aware that they were fully funded up to, I think, June of this year, or so they claim. And hopefully this will give enough time to clear up the uncertainty about the state's future finances and that the interest rate uh, that will be charged on government debt will have fallen to more reasonable levels. It should be noted, however, that at the time of the NTMA's withdrawal from the bond markets, the state, having issued 20 billion worth of bonds last year as an exercise in prudence, as the point I made, was fully, uh, is fully funded up to June 2011. You might well ask the question, what was happening in financial regulation and the issue uh, of the whole issue of corporate governments? Well, it's clear that the bank's govern governance and risk management were weak, in some cases disastrously so. This contributed to the crisis through several channels. One, credit risk controls failed to prevent severe concentration in lending on property, including notably commercial property. As well, there was high exposures to individual borrowers. Thirdly, there was a serious over-dependence on wholesale funding. Fourthly, it appears that internal procedures were overridden, sometimes system systematically. What was the Irish government's response? Well, in September 2009, the government appointed uh, Patrick, Professor Patrick Honahan as a new governor of the central bank. Conahan, of course, had worked, uh, had worked in the Central Bank years before, worked at the World Bank, was a distinguished professor at Trinity College Dublin, one of Ireland's uh, best-known universities. 
Uh, the following month, in October 2009, uh, an Englishman, Mr. Matthew Ed Edderfield, who had experience in financial regulation at the UK's FSA and <coughs> elsewhere, was brought in and appointed the new financial regulator. He had recently been head of financial regulation in Bermuda. Some months later, the government re uh, revamped the then existing regulatory structure, the Central Reform Act 2010, created a single uh, unitary body, the Central Bank, with a unitary board called the Central Bank Commission, responsible bo for both central banking and financial regulation. The new structure replaced the previous related uh, entities of the Central Bank and the Financial Serv uh, Services Authority of Ireland. This came into force last October, on the 1st of October. The government also set about, on a phase basis, a clear-out of bank directors and the top managements of the banks. It also proposed new rules on bank directors and corporate governments, and has made very lo loud noises about uh, salary caps and curbs on bonuses. There was a suggestion that we're going to tax 90% uh, on uh, bank bonuses. But I think the Constitution got in the way. Um, how is the real economy performing? Well, following the bursting of the property bubble in uh, early 2008, Ireland became the first member to fall into recession in the summer of 2008. Other line of sight indicators that I'd like to make quick mention of in matters such as public sector growth, taxation, GDP, GNP, employment, inflation, external trade, and national debt, uh, I think are worth uh, a, a quick word. Public sector growth. Uh, from the late 1990s, public sector wage settlements had accelerated markedly, with compensation per employee increasing at a rate two to three times the Eurozone average. Competitiveness deteriorated significantly and the growth rate of public expenditure also accelerated to the highest uh, place among the developed world. The number of staff in the Irish public sector uh, between uh, 2001 and 2008 grew by 15.5%. Taxation. There was over-dependence on transient kinds of taxes, such as stamp duty and capital gains tax during the property boom which gave rise to a hidden vulnerability, and that's a quote, in Ireland's fiscal situation. Fifteen fat years had allowed the Irish government to cut income tax, increase spending, and still run a budget surplus. Between 2007 and 2009, however, tax revenue fell by a whopping 20%, while expenditure rose by 9%, moving the state from a balanced budget to a deficit of 12% of GDP. Mention of GDP and GNP. In statistical terms, Ireland's growth was 4.7% in 2007, but minus 1.7% in 2008, minus 7.1% in 2009. However, Ireland then officially exited recession in 2010 following a growth of 0.3% in Q4 of, of 2009 and 2.7% in Q1 of 2010. The main reason, of course, for the sharp increase in the fiscal def deficit in 2008-2009 was indeed the collapse of tax revenue. This was possible because the structure of tax revenue had changed dramatically from, 1990s, from the 1990s to the year 2006-2007. As I've already explained, the composition of tax revenue had shifted gradually from stable sources of taxation like personal income tax, VAT, excise taxes, to cyclical taxes such as corporation tax, stamp duty and capital gains tax. The share of these cyclical taxes reached 30% of tax revenues for the country in 2006. What was it uh, in the 1980s? 8%. Huge change. After stagnating in GDP terms in 2010, the, econ the economy is expected to grow again next year and to be expanding at roughly 3% pace by 2012. 
this is seen as sufficient uh, to result in employment growth resuming and unemployment rates fall, uh, falling to less than 10% by 2014. Employment. On the employment front, by February 2009, the rate of employment had jumped to 10.4% of the workforce, workforce, according to official statistics. And as I've mentioned earlier, there is further deterioration since then, and the most recent figure is 13.4%. That's December 2010. Inflation. As might be expected, given the extent of the recession, inflation has not been a problem in recent years, although it's beginning to rise slightly. We all know the reasons for that rising in all countries. The Consumer Price Index, the CPI, is up by 0.6% as of November uh, compared with November 2009. External trade. This has been one notable bright spot. In terms of external trade, Ireland benefited significantly from the pickup in global trade last year. Both our merchandise and services sector performed well and are expected to continue to do so. Indeed, the latest figure that I got when I got off the plane yesterday suggests it has rolled forward into January. Of the EU countries, Ireland's trade surplus ranks second only to Germany in the first or ranks uh, second only to Germany in the first 9 months of 2010 with a surplus of 36 billion national debt national debt has stood at 93.4 billion at the end of 2010 and the cost of servicing the national debt is 4.8 billion so by way of overview of these <coughs> indicators I suppose I should say that the recovery to uh, positive growth in 2010 has masked huge changes in the economic, social and political out, uh, outlook for the country. And you will probably be aware that uh, Ireland's position is that it has a twin track <coughs> economy. Firstly, it has a booming export uh, sector powered by major multinational corporations. And secondly, it has a depressed domestic economy burdened by very weak consumer demand and very high levels of unemployment. There's about 430,000 people unemployed at the moment. These factors, of course, have resulted in a rise in emigration to territories like Canada, Australia, uh, the UK, of course, as well, where prospects of gainful employment are much more uh, promising. So, the government response to what has it been to budgetary matters and economic planning. In recent years, the main context of the annual Exchequer budget in December is well known or well signalled in advance. Last year, we kind of knew nearly everything beforehand. Uh, introduced in December. In early November, a month earlier, the Department of Finance, which was the equivalent of the, UK, of the US Treasury, published an information note on the budgetary and economic outlook for the four-year period 2011-2014. This was later followed by the National Recovery Plan for the same period in late December. Then, just as the austerity packages were being finalised in November, the European Central Bank decided apparently very suddenly, although I don't believe it, but to intervene. The preemptive EU IMF bailout, which the Irish government attempted to repulse until it became clear that resistance was futile, was unprecedented. And it was indicative of the loss of faith of other that other Europeans had in the ability of the government to manage the banking crisis. The reality was that Irish banks had grown increasingly reliant on funding from the ECB, the European Central Bank, as other commercial banks had been reluctant to lend, them, uh, or to, lend to them following the financial crisis in fellow Euro Eurozone uh, member state country, Greece. Soon afterwards, there was an even more uh, detailed memorandum of understanding associated with the 85,000 funding arrangements this was agreed with the IMF and the EU. Significant conditions, of course, were applied. 
quick, quick word on our slide on the uh, National Recovery Plan. Basically, uh, in November 2010, published, uh, it aims to restore order to the public finances and to bring the deficit in line with the EU stability target of 3% of economic output by 2015. Involves a budget adjustment, uh, adjustment of 15 billion, 10 billion in public expenditure cuts, and 5 billion in taxes over a four year period. This will be front loaded in 2011. I think most of us have all taken pay cuts of about 15% already in the last uh, uh, few months, which Incidentally, we often heard in the past about people in the United States taking pay cuts and we would have considered it absolutely off the agenda. And suddenly here we're emulating the United States. This will be front loaded in, in, in the, the 10 billion cuts are front loaded in 2011 where measures totaling 6 billion are planned. VAT, of course, is going to be increased by, uh, by 20, to 23% by, that's v VAT meaning value added tax, I assume you have the same thing here, by 2014. And a property tax and a domestic water charge is to be introduced. Uh, the EU IMF rescue uh, package. At the end of November, the EU approved a package of 85 billion euro rescue package for Ireland and outlined a permanent system, or sorry, sought to outline, I should say, a permanent system to resolve Europe's debt crisis, in which investors could gradually share the cost uh, in any future default. Some 35 billion euros were earmarked to help restructure the shattered Irish banking system, of which 10 billion was earmarked as an immediate capital injection, and the rest a contingency fund. Ireland will contribute 17.5 billion euros of its own cash and pension reserves to the bank rescue, funds that were built up by the NTMA. The rest of the emergency loans, which the government said were granted at an average interest rate of 5.8%, will help cover the giant hole the banks have blown in the public finances. The IMF will contribute 22.5 billion euros uh, while the loans will run for an average of 7.5 years, the term of the three EU, uh, the three year, uh, the terms of the three year EU IMF funding program, including loans of various maturities up to 12 years, with an average maturity of seven and a half years. This was important from a debt management point of view to avoid a situation where Ireland would be faced with a funding wall upon completion of the program. Strict targets were set and reporting procedures were set as a condition of financial support. Some of you will have read in the last 10 days, the IMF people have been back in assessing whether those developments or the milestones have been achieved or not. And there are conflicting reports in the press as to whether they have or they haven't been. Uh, ostensibly, they have been but equally the government, the Irish government, which was supposed to put about 10 billion into uh, uh, to uh, recapitalize two of the banks, uh, postponed it until after the election. So I'm not sure what the situation is there at the moment. The goal of the aid, uh, the EU IMF aid, was to return the economy to sustainable growth and restore the health of the banking system. Uh, the, a couple of points about the EU IMF plan and banking. Ireland has retained its 12.5 corporation tax, despite a less than forthcoming acceptance of this provision from some of our EU uh, partners. But it was a crucial outcome. An awful lot of the FDI companies, we would suspect, are in Ireland because of the low corporation tax. With the further restructuring of the Irish banking system, it's most probable that the Irish state will end up owning the vast majority of the country's banking sector. Indeed, that's becoming, uh, fast becoming a reality. And that uh, Anglo-Irish Bank will be wound up very soon, early in 2011, as part of the EU IMF plan for Ireland. An obligation set uh, by the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, 
was that external advisor would be appointed to uh, help bring about a major downsizing of the domestic banking sector and international financial heavyweights, Barclays Capital, the Boston <coughs> Consulting Group and BlackRock Solutions have been appointed to help in the reshaping and ultimately in the reduction uh, in the size of the domestic banks. That's all the bad news. Uh, but despite these gloomy perceptions, we can say some things on the optimistic side. We can say that the EU IMF deal gives the Irish economy the time to show that it can recover. Convincing Irish citizens that we have a positive economic future. Of course, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. It also gives time to convince the markets that Ireland can and will repay its debts, reducing the cost of future borrowing and rendering the debt levels uh, even more sustainable through significant economic growth. That economic growth, again, end of January figures, is positive. Uh, the Irish budget, to give you an idea of the scale, uh, the current expenditure deficit to be filled was of the order of 19 billion. We know that over the next four years, there will be cumulative adjustments of 15 billion in uh, budgetary measures, 10 billion in spending cuts and 5 billion in tax increases. This amounts to a cumulative reduction of 12% in nominal terms in current spending and a whopping 43% reduction in capital spending. Tax revenues, meanwhile, are slated to increase by up to 35%. Taking into consideration stated government intentions to cope uh, with the crisis, I think most people here would probably argue that Ireland's response to the austerity measures goes rather against the grain. In America and, and Britain, fiscal policy is geared to avoiding deflation which raises the real cost of debt. But Ireland seeks salvation in lower wages, even though its households are also heavily indebted. Whereas many countries want to lift their economies by fiscal expansion, Ireland is tightening its belt. Few other countries face such big deficits. The Irish planners and stakeholders hope for a payoff in improved confidence amongst foreign investment and also a continuation of the positive end, uh, uh, measures in the economy for the people at home. There are, of course, some barriers which, and impacts which I need to mention and will have to be taken into account. One worrying extent, uh, external factor uh, is the current questioning by the international investors and the fund managers concerning the future of Europe and the fear of this causing economic instability within Europe itself. It has been hugely destabilizing that debate in, uh, when Ireland, just before the uh, IMF uh, people came in, uh, it, it looked like as if Ireland was on the periphery and they were talking about Europe primarily. Secondly, real or perceived con uh, contagion amongst the weaker I suppose what you'd call the peripheral European EU countries. You know, who's going to be next under pressure? It's a big worry uh, as lenders uh, run for cover. I think in the la since last November, I think the number of times that uh, you read in the Financial Times and presumably in the Wall Street Journal as well, but certainly in the, fin the London Financial Times about uh, scares that, you know, Poland, or not Poland, that Portugal and Spain and Italy and Belgium and so on, only to have them denied and uh, not to turn out true, has caused huge problems for the Irish economy. We're a peripheral economy, we're a pipsqueak in the scheme of things, but you, you couldn't get people to focus specifically on the peculiar Irish problems. We are not the same as Iceland, we're not the same as Greece, we have problems, but they need to be dealt with on the basis of the problems we have, not on the basis of whether 
the euro is going to fall. And unfortunately, it's my view that it's complete speculation that the euro will fall. It's partly triggered by the Brits all kind of saying, well, we're right not to go into the euro. And sometimes even US correspondents uh, making judgments beyond the particular circumstances of the euro. But we can argue about that or questioning if needs be. Third point that I'd wish to make is the Irish banking system is contracting uh, and is not operating fully in terms of supporting business, industry and the economy in general, which of course presents additional challenges in Australia for corporate treasury managers. It's a whole area, the whole area of credit. Um, so, the management of the Irish economic crisis, let it be clearly stated, is very much a work in progress. Things are happening. They may not be happening as fast as they should, but they are happening. The last three months, as I've said, uh, have been mesmerizingly hectic in terms of the issues, the debates, the highs, the lows, calculated to give students of public administration, if not MBA students, uh, early coronaries. I, however, remain steadfastly positive. Ireland has coped with se severe economic downturns before and will, I believe, do so again this time. Its people are resilient and resourceful. And the population has an unusually high level of entrepreneurial flair and culture, as well as a worldwide supportive diaspora. Uncertainty, of course, begets fears. And there is great uncertainty about the final figure of the, the, the Irish banks will require to restore a fully functioning banking system without which no, other, no modern economy can thrive. Certainty in this matter would engender confidence among foreign lenders so that bond yields would fall and the NTMA could return to the marketplace. On the purely domestic issues, a resolution of the problem would restore confidence. Tomorrow, Irish people go to the polls in national elections. And the current government look like being thrown out. But I'd like to suggest to you that it doesn't really matter that much whether they are or not, because the people who are coming in, uh, the point I, was, uh, I would make is that the elections should bring an, an end to the instability at home, given that the new government is, if anything, likely to be more compliant to meeting the fundamentals of the IMF EU plan. And uh, despite some election hyperbole, uh, and they'll have a renewed or strong mandate from the people. International markets will, in time, recognise that Ireland is not Greece or Iceland. There is, for me anyway, an old adage which I hold and held well for me for 36 of the years that I spent dealing with different parts of the administration and the, pol uh, the politicians in Ireland. Uh, out of every crisis, there's an opportunity. The celebrated Irish novelist of the early part of the last century, James Joyce, gave a cryptic expression to my optimism when he said, and I quote, a man's errors are the portals of his discovery, unquote. Bono, the veteran rock singer of the Irish uh, U2 band, who grew up close to me to where I live in Malahide County, Dublin, is quoted in relation to another matter, but which could be equally applied to the current crisis. And I quote, we thought we had the answers. It was the questions that we had wrong. Not just for regulators, but for all the stakeholders in the banking and regulatory and political mess. And lastly, given that I, as a young student, in the early 1960s, stood in O'Connell Street, Dublin, 
watching your president, John F. Kennedy, watching his cavalcade pass by, and was hugely inspired by his inspirational leadership quotes, such as, if you're, you may have read about them, you're too young, Ich bin ein Berliner, or ask not what your country could do f uh, for you, rather what you could do for your country. I'm quite taken uh, in the current circumstances by a much lesser known observation of his, and I quote, our problems are man-made, therefore they, are so uh, they may be solved by man. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings, unquote. Let us all in this room focus on discovery. Let's go to, uh, get to it. Thank you for your attention. Yes, sir. Yeah. I was just wondering, Declan, if you could talk about like, where you were and what you know, some of your craziest days looked like as this was kind of all unraveling. And, and if you could just repeat the question so we'll have it on tape as well. Okay. Can I ask you to repeat the question? <laughs> I don't know I can. It's really, uh, just a, a descriptor of, of like, where you were in, in all this and a description of you know, some of okay. the craziest days you faced. Uh, I started out uh, in education. I became, I was appointed a lecturer in a university in Northern Ireland, but for the, 36, for the last 36 years before I retired, I worked with the Irish Institute of Public Administration, which would be a kind of a very minor version of the Kennedy School of Government. In that, I originally got involved in providing executive education courses for people, but I ended up as the uh, manager of a team of accountants and economists, te teams of accountants, economists, and teams of organizational specialists, including HR people. In that process, I would have met most politicians, most government ministers of any persuasion when we opened conferences or published books. So I would be aware of the regulators, the, the, the people, who, the, the, the regulators. I'd be aware of central and local government managements. And for the vast majority of that time, I was hugely impressed by the quality and the commitment of public officials at all levels. Something happened in the late 90s, early 2000, where it was the era of light touch regulation. Uh, and I think they confused light touch with purposefully assertive regulation. They certainly took their eye off the ball. May have been influenced, I think, significantly by uh, the fact that it was not profitable to insist on minimal intrusion. They took what the banks, for example, told them when they should have sent in some of my teams, dare I say it, in to check them out. Uh, but the bank, uh, so, so the regulators didn't, uh, they, 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 they took whatever they were given rather than independent, providing independent scrutiny. I think that was a major mistake. You know, it was very unpopular. We, we, our approach, the Irish economy, has, has more in keeping with the open U, uh, US economy. You know, we would be very concerned that too much regulation would stunt economic growth or the ability of people to do whatever they wanted to do. Having said that, interest groups, were very strong, the Employers' Confederation, if you added an extra layer of any regulation to something, they sh sh shouted from the rooftops. So there was a problem, we have to acknowledge it. And the new regulators, certainly the Irish government in the appointment of Matthew Ederfield, fantastic, I think a fantastic guy, uh, worth looking at his speeches since he became in, you'd get him on the internet, you know, Irish regulator. 
I think most public servants who have been vilified now, and the vast majority, have worked very hard. And Blair is upset with the way the economy has gone. Uh, clearly, I mentioned the Anglo-Irish Bank. Uh, I would have had dealings myself with Anglo-Irish Bank uh, at conferences. They were, they were sponsoring conferences all over Ireland, the UK. They had operations here in the United States and some very fine people in it. But there was a core people, it seems to me, at the top that didn't have any, I have to be careful because there are potential legal actions occurring in relation to some of them, but let's say the normal, when I grew up as a child in Tipperary, the local bank manager was king. He was a pillar of community, like the local clergyman or whatever. Banks were conservative. When I went to buy my house in Dublin, they would only give me two and a half times my salary. When I have two children, who, uh, four children, one of whom is here, over here on the, uh, two children in London who are in the investment banking business, and I try to encourage them to come back, even if they were still staying in London. One of them is a hedge fund, well, was a hedge fund uh, um, manager, and the other is a credit derivatives trader. And I encourage them to come back and buy a house in Dublin so that if and when they ever came back, they'd get on the property ladder. And I'm happy as a father to say I was wrong about that advice. <laughs> they came over to Dublin, they looked at house prices in where we live and in the next two towns, and they said, Dad, this is insane. I met them as it happens last week in London. Uh, I was at a meeting in London last week and uh, discussing, amongst other things, what I might say here today because there are areas that I would have no background in that they have. Uh, but I had to acknowledge that my advice was wrong. They went back to London and they bought a house near Battersea Park for less than what they could buy the house in Dublin. So my point about the you know, house prices were uh, completely awry and that was because a small group of builders, developers, uh, bought up most of the land, for example, around the Dublin area, land parcels. They took huge money or loans from the banks. The banks rolled over the debt, typical builder or a developer. Uh, what they did was, as, as I understand it, I mean, I haven't examined this myself, but if you borrowed, let's say, 100 million, and they wouldn't expect, if they were developing the land and building houses, they wouldn't have the money to pay it back until, let's say, the third year. So what they did was they rolled over the debt each year. But by the time the debt, uh, the whole thing was dependent on prices continuing to rise. But in fact, and of course the banks, including Allied Irish banks and the Bank of Ireland, when they saw the way Anglo were behaving, they decided we better get a bite of the cherry here. And that, of course, led to some of the problems uh, that they have. And ultimately, what they were doing was they were borrowing on the short term, the overnight market, but giving it out long term. So what am I saying? I'm saying that uh, we have to have our purgatory. Uh, people who talk about not... Uh, you know, honor, you know, people talk about burning the bondholders and so on. I don't accept that. I think we have to take the IMF um, EU approach, work with them positively. If we run into some difficulty, show that we Irish people will argue, they'll negotiate, but they will always pay at the end. They're not... They understand they have more in common with you than like, I can't imagine Irish people doing what they're doing in Iceland. And if you think of it another way, because we're an island nation, we have a history of knowing you know, the limits 
you know, small population and so on. So we do cut our cloth according to our measure. We've kind of gone out of time here. We're going to have to go and stop. But before we do, um, yesterday when uh, Declan came to visit me, um, I had a speaker here for him. I gave him a box of Girl Scout Thin Mint cookies. This is American. Um, but um, I wanted to give him uh, something from the Kelly School. Um, I'm sure they have golf courses over there. And you have, have a little golf shirt here for you. Yeah. Um, this is official uh, IU Kelly School of Business shirt. Thank and uh, take it with thank our you very thanks. Much. And thank, thank you very much for coming here and uh, giving our speech today. Thank you. I'll be the proud wearer, and if any of you come to Ireland, look us up. Okay.